Welcome to the Raise Podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We're here to raise your confidence and inspire your creativity. Each episode, we will have a different guest who will be discussing our Raise Word. The Raise Word is a word that will encourage you or empower you and at times inspire you to explore the word a little more for yourself. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to The Raised Podcast. I'm Carol Barwick. We've looked at some really interesting words uh, this season so far, and some that you might think are really simple. And this one today is one of those throwaway words that you might not even think about that much, but actually it's got a lot of power, and it's the word can. And we're going to look at it with the uh, owner of Can Do, Joanne Jones. Hi, Joe. how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. You're so welcome. Before we dive into all that Can Do um, does and uh, tells us about, um, tell me what does the word can mean to you? So I suppose as the essence of the word can do is a bit of a rebellion for me because I came to the word can via the word can't. And the reason for that was because I was working in the NHS as a speech and language therapist. And what I found was and started to get weighed down by was the emphasis on what children can't do. Um, And I think that there's probably a little bit of this in all of us that we're influenced and think about what we can't do more than we do about what we can do. But when parents were being delivered news about what their child can't do, it was very heavy and very difficult for them to manage. And I, my brain just kept thinking about well, what can they do? Like, what, what is it that they can do? Why, why are we talking all the time about what they can't do? These little people can do amazing things. Let's stop focusing on the, the, the can'ts. Um, and so for me, it's standing up against that and thinking, no, hang on a minute. I'm not going to go down that line. Let's think about what we can do. Love it. What a great way to, to open the episode. Thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, can't is, it, it, the word can't for me is it feels like one of those shutters on the shops at the end of the day, just a zoom. No, thank you. Not today. Nothing for you here kind of thing. Um, and the word can, I think sometimes it it can also it, it well, just then it's such a little throwaway word. We can do this. We can do that. But actually, the power of can and as you said, that rebellion of the word can is um is wonderful so it it makes me think a bit of resilience would you say there's a bit of resilience in the word can yeah I think so and um I think that when you change your mindset to looking for the can that gives you the resilience I get a bit frustrated with the word resilience and I think from my own personal experience of having a child who was being bullied at primary school and the teacher saying well you know it's because she's not resilient enough and it's made it makes my heckle stand up a little bit like yes we do need to be resilient but come we need to be a bit careful about um what resilience is and so when we turn that and flip that and think well what can we do what could I do to help my daughter in that situation what can she do to manage what was happening it puts the power back in your hands you're not it it doesn't come with blame can in some in some way it it helps you to feel empowered Mm, yeah love that yeah we uh we did a, a podcast episode uh, uh, last season about resilience and one of the questions I made sure I asked was what's difficult and challenging about the word resilience because I think resilience can be a bit of a like a sticking plaster but worse one of those sticking plasters that doesn't stick on properly or you just need a bit of resilience and you'll be you'll be fine um but yeah I love that that the word can doesn't have that blame attached to it that's really really powerful joe because um blame is everywhere when it comes to the child can't xyz can't whatever it is the blame that's attached to that is immense isn't it tell me a little bit of your experience of that kind of blame culture and and what you're doing to alleviate it 
Yeah, so I think that what has happened within um, the health and education sector is that we've created these lovely little convenient boxes um, that we like to put children into and we like to um, check them off against certain criteria in order for them to fit into those boxes. And I understand in a way why that's happened. It's it's um, it's easier and it's more streamlined and it um, can be consistent across lots of different areas. But what it does is it leaves everybody outside of that feeling that, that there's something wrong with them if mm. they can't fit into that box. Whereas actually that box... It doesn't represent humans. It's just a very small amount of people that can fit into that box naturally. And so what happens is that if you're you're concerned about your child and you go and seek out support for that, the, the starting point on that journey is a list of all of the can'ts. And come so the parent interprets that as well, this is what my child should be doing. And if my child isn't doing this, then mm. I must have done something wrong. Yeah. And that triangle becomes very heavy. I call it the backpack of responsibility. Like parents carry this backpack that's mm. heavy because they're like, well, what, what can I do to help my child do this? I want to be doing something. And unfortunately, the way things are set up is it's very difficult to get to what you can do to help. It's very much a, 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 we'll go for this assessment to find out what else they can't do. And we'll put you on this list and we'll we'll find out what's wrong in that department. And so it just starts to stack up with no kind of through road as to how to help and how to help their child be able to do these things. And I meet parents every day who that burden is very heavy and very difficult to carry and they become disempowered, they become incredibly anxious and they start to look at their children through a lens of can't and they're making those comparisons, what the neighbour's child did at that age, what their sibling did at that age, what their nephew did Mm -hmm. and so all the time all they can see is that list of can'ts. And, you know, in my work, we talk, we switch that, we change the lens, we start to look for what the child can do. And when you start to just change what you're looking for, it's like you see what you look for. And when you start to look at what they can do, things start to lift. They feel lighter and you see that progress in everyday little moments because you're like, well, actually, they can do this. And actually, I didn't realise they were doing that because I was so busy focusing on them not being able to do this. And so I think that there's such empowerment in that moment of switch. And it's one of the things that I love the most in the work that I do is when the parents switch to um, seeing those can-dos and be going, oh, my gosh, Joanne, I didn't even realise that there was all of this that was so positive. Yeah, yeah, this is so good. I mean, I'm being very quiet but I'm just kind of nodding my head because everything you're saying is just like truth bomb truth bomb everywhere um just so important I mean being a lover of words as I am obviously the word can't is an abbreviation of can not and you are literally taking the not away aren't you you're saying no we're, we're not we're not dealing with the nots we're looking at the the cans and the yeses and the as you said that through road how is that child going to navigate through because they can do all of this stuff um and yeah that backpack of responsibility is so heavy weighing so heavy on so many parents and guardians and carers shoulders and teachers um and being able to lift it is a is a gift it's a gift joe so tell us about can do and uh and all about that and ha- how it came about so in 2018 i'd been working in the nhs for 20 years and i just i just wanted to do it differently and really i'm a speech and language therapist but i'm an entrepreneur i'm an ideas person i've always got like ideas and and things that i want to do and you know the nhs does its best but it's a slow moving machine and so i always felt like a square peg in a round hole it would always be you know what's the one coming up with this time because i just could see all of these 
things that we could be doing. And so yeah. finally got brave enough to say, right, I'm going to try and do this on my own. And I didn't know how that was going to look or, or what that was going to be. But I just set off on the journey of being online and seeing how I could support parents. And when I set off, I started kind of teaching them all the things that I had learned in the order that I learned them and um you know almost turning them into speech therapists and some brave souls did go through that process and learn and enjoyed learning but what I realized really quickly is that what parents needed was easy they needed me to strip it out they just mm-hmm. needed the, the core of what was going to make the most difference and so in 2020 we have we're all in lockdown everyone was in their homes and I set about running a 12-week program I got up at, and and was live at 7 a.m three times a week and presented and grew this idea of focusing on the cans, giving parents things that they could do because that's the other thing often expectations of the things that are given as a solution to parents and become the roadblock. So, you know, use Makaton with your child. It's a very easy thing to say, but it's not an easy thing to a get yourself on a Makaton course because often it's three months before you can get on one or, you know, is your child even looking at your hands? So is it wasting your time anyway? So all of these things are just another layer for parents to do. And what I wanted to do was strip all of that out and go, right, what can you do with what you've got now? And let's focus on that. And then what happens is we focus on what the child can do with what they've got now. And we start to build progress. And we were just seeing amazing progress in the children. Children who were five that had never spoken were starting to talk because that shift was so monumental for the families and for the children. Um, And what became a very desperate time for people in lockdown where they had no support and they didn't know what they were going to do actually became this really positive journey. And it it was amazing for me to see that I could work in that way. And there were amazing families who gave me the confidence to think that the world needs to know this, the world, you know, if the, these parents need this. And so since then, it's just been about building it, getting the message out there, working with as many parents as I can through these kind of online programs and um, giving them the tools that are going to make the difference for their child. And what I found was, and I didn't know when I set off, is when you do more of what the child can already do, the child makes progress. And nothing that's out there does that. In terms of speech therapy, there might be another field, but we always stand in the goal. The goal is that your child will speak in two word sentences. The goal is that your child will follow instructions. The goal is that your child will sit there and listen to a story. It stands in the place of what the child can't do and says, come on, child, you should be over here. What am I going to do to make you? Well, how can I get them there? That was, the parents would say, how can I get my child to do this? But actually, if we stop that focus and we looked at what the child was already doing, what the child can do, and we did more of it, the child was more connected to the parent. The child built their confidence. I could talk about them being little rosebuds that were all tight and closed up because it was all so difficult. And they began to un- unravel and show themselves they unfurled and they showed what they could do. And so when that happened and the parents were brave enough to not stand in that goal that everyone was telling them they should be standing in and just do more of what that child could already do, that's when we saw the pro the pro progress, and that's when I knew that that power of can was just so important. Wow! Again, what, what those pictures of us standing in the goal, in the way of what we're wanting our tri- child to achieve, um, but that release of that. There's not a blame there. It's about saying what well, enjoy watching what your child can do now Um, and the power of doing it literally at the time where pretty much the whole world was told you can't you can't breathe on certain people you can't blow out your birthday candles you can't go to the shops you can't make the things that you want to because you haven't got the right ingredients you can't have parties you can't see your friends um and yet you were investing in this entire world of can um and bringing these amazing young young people and young minds um and parents along with them onto this journey can i ask you often um 
in interviews and things like that, the question is asked, why you? But why you, Joe? What what was it that made you think I need to do this? It's a really tricky one because I knew, I always knew that I wanted to use the skills that I had honed over the 20 years as a speech therapist, that I wanted to use those to create something of my own. That And I tried things, I'd kind of owned a nursery for a few years and I'd done children's classes like back in the day. So I'd always tried to do things where I wasn't actually being a speech therapist with a caseload, but I was using my skills to support um, parents with my knowledge. Um, and so when I set off on this journey in 2018, and I was kind of doing what I always knew, and it sounds a bit far-fetched, and I don't really know what happened, but I, this almost came to me, like it just kept, it just came to me as to, I have like four pillars, and I have the airspace strategies, and I, it just, it just happened, like it was like coming into my brain, and I was writing it down, and it always feels, and I'm not religious in any way, or and like, it, or anything, but it feels as though it's almost not mine, but it's my responsibility to share it, mm -hmm. I feel as though it, 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 I just kind of caught it from somewhere, and now it's my job to put it out in the world, and it's, not always been easy it's hard work like anyone who works in the online space knows how relentless you've got to be and how you've got to keep on and just trying to spread the word is very hard work and there's times when I honestly think like I don't I can't do this anymore and in those times I remember like it's not about me I've got to share this I've got to get that out there it feels like something else that is just my job to share with the world is it a kind of a bit of a gift that you've been given to kind of share and yeah I don't know it just yeah it's just it was just like it, yeah like I sometimes think how did I even come up with this like where did I get that knowledge from like I, I don't know it, yeah it just seemed to go beyond what I really knew and yet it worked and that sounds ridiculous when I say it but it's definitely how how it kind of felt at the time well, not at all, because it was your can, wasn't it? Well, I can do this. I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm I'm thinking, well, what can I do? And this is what I can do. And then um, all of those gifts and skills and abilities um, proved it through the writing and the materials and the programs and the way that you speak. I know that you've been on the, on the one show and various other podcasts and radio stations, and you can see why you're really inspiring. Um, and and you believe it. You know, when you say, I can do this, we believe it. <laughs> um, there's that, there's that kind of just, I don't know, brightness and and but but that confidence as well. And you know, again, I'm thinking about words and that kind of thing, and I'm I, I love mashups, and I'm thinking of like can fidence you know it's like that yeah yeah of course yeah. we can of course we can and yeah. who doesn't want somebody telling you that you can do it yeah no that's yeah that's a really good reminder and I think you know I felt that um I had that to give the parents and in that first 12 weeks that I did I could see how they were there kind of absorbing that and needing to hear that. And, you know, I, I don't want to criticise the NHS because they're doing a wonderful job, but there's definitely a, a kind of um, ethos that you can't be too enthusiastic. You don't want to make false promises. You can't promise your time or promise the outcome for the children. And um, you're within, everybody feels that, you know, it's just part of, you know, you've got to be cautious. You don't want to give false hope. But as a mom, like I'm a mum of four, and I, it just started to dawn on me as like, if you've not got hope, what have you got? And if you can't kind of get that hope from yourself, you need somebody saying, this can be okay. This is going to be okay. There is a journey to go on, but you can make it, your child can make it. And you need to have high expectations of your child. And what your child can do is the absolute start of that. And so when you're... I was released from from not wanting to say that and I was able to give that message 
I then found that people were finding that really um, empowering and energizing and motivating to keep going and, and keep keep because it, it, it's hard, isn't it? And we all know it's hard. Yeah, and I think you know, as as you said, you're not you're being aspirational, but you're not you're not getting them to look way into the future. You're looking at the present, and I wonder if that is one of the the biggest power that you've got in this is that you're absolutely getting people to look in the moment. And again, um, that was one of the things we were forced to do in lockdown. You had to look at the present. No one really wanted to look at the future. And going back into the past was an absolute nightmare because we all had too much space to think. So nobody wanted to go back into the past. And so everything was about now and I think um that focusing on the on the present uh, that's where can dwells isn't it and that's the other thing I mean again just thinking about words you know could that's the past but can is present and future oh my word boom <laughs> that yeah. was a big revelation but it is isn't it yeah absolutely absolutely and I think you know, one of the things um, was that per- it's about value as well yeah. and the value of your child and how actually the parents felt that their ch- children were devalued because they became a, a, a list of the, a sum of their can'ts and that they therefore felt that society, the medical profession, education – didn't hold any value for their child because their child wasn't achieving all of these things. And I think that when you look at what your child can do and you bring it back to that, you see that your child has got value and that you that value isn't about how developmentally great you are. Like the value comes from just being that little person. And I think that that was that is very empowering for parents to kind of reframe it that hang on a minute, who is thinking about value in terms of just development? How can that be right? I hope you're feeling as positive as I am right now listening to Joe. If you want to help support Raise, then you can. You can go to your favourite podcast platform. You can give us a follow, you can subscribe, and then you can tell other people to do the same. You can also give us a five-star rating. Thank you so much for your support. Back to the episode. Yeah, I think there's a lot we talk a lot about um doing things don't we i i know that there's people always say you know when you go to weddings or when you're with lots of different business people try not to say what do you do it's about kind of who are you and at the end of the day we are human beings and again it's that being which is present it's the present and the and the future um and uh i think that is such an important part of of recognizing that not just in our children but in each other in everybody that we we are all here and we need to be valued we all have things that we can do um just over the last few weeks in my raised community group I've been talking about kind of gifts and receiving and asking and things like that and the number of people that are are reticent to ask for help or or, or can even recognize that they've got these gifts and, and skills. And yet so much worth and value, more so than ever before, because of social media and influencing and all that kind of thing is about what can you do? How much do you earn? How many followers do you have? It's all about the, you know, um, what have you got kind of thing. And I think the question that you're asking is, you know, who who are you? and uh, um um where where are you right now where are you up to um and i think that's in- incredibly powerful 
Um, it's something yeah. definitely within the human psyche that we like to focus on our can'ts, our deficits. And I think it probably comes from a, a kind of fight or flight situation that, you know, your brain goes to the negatives to keep you safe. And so yeah. then what happens is that we look at others to see what they can't do so that we can feel better about the things that we can't do. Um, and so it becomes like this negative kind of feedback loop because we're always trying to kind of make ourselves feel feel better and yet our brain is kind of reminding us of the things where we're lacking or we're not doing or we can't do and so I think there's a definite natural kind of uh, style where we test each other or we want to know like where that other person's um um weaknesses are so that we don't feel as bad we think oh it's okay because other people are like that too um and so it's only natural that we kind of then do that to our children and get that negative feedback going and so what I found with the parents is that not only were they feeling more positive about their children but they 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 became more aware of their own thoughts and yeah. more able to to switch those to um to what is positive and so although it started about speech and language therapy it became much bigger than that because there's definitely a kind of psychological element to how we all think yeah and I think I mean it, it it's it's got it's key for mental health as well isn't it because you know literally mental health is just the health of the mind and so having a a, a positive um mental attitude around what you can do and 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 who you are is is very much key to that confidence that you're then going to be able to progress um and do other things and um, can you tell us a little bit let's drill down a little bit into what the programs actually are and also uh you've got an app coming out is that correct yes tell us a bit about that so the program um is now a six week program because I found that it was very difficult after lockdown for people to kind of keep with something for so many weeks. I didn't want it to be a barrier to, for people. Um, mm. So over that six weeks, I teach them how to work out where their child's up to, but in a way of what they can do, not what they can't do. And then how to adapt their everyday little moments um, so they're using their interaction to support their children's interaction. And what happens is instead of speech therapy becoming this thing where you do some flashcards or you sit in a room and do some exercises, it becomes about every day and about um, meal times and getting in the car times and going up the stairs times and being able to change that interaction to absolutely enhance the child's confidence and communication. Um, and so that has just been rolling as a kind of six week program. And I've got a membership that pa parents just can choose to stay in where we kind of talk about wider topics and they get that ongoing support and encouragement. And so um, I wanted to find a way because I do a lot through Facebook and Facebook is not great for people who are worried about their children because yeah. we all know we go onto Facebook and everyone's saying how amazing their life is and how amazing their children are doing. And if you're not feeling that, you just see that as a place that makes you feel uncomfortable. And so I've been thinking for a while that I want to kind of take it away from Facebook and have another way of being able to reach people. And I've created an app, it's my own kind of app, and it's going to allow us to have those courses on there that parents can access. There's a community forum that's away from Facebook that they can ask me anything. There will be lives in there, notifications to give them ideas to do activities. And so it's going to be like a speech therapist in your pocket, like there's going to be that support there all of the time that doesn't mean that you have to log on to Facebook and see all the things that you didn't want to have to see. Uh, it's called Ask a Speech Therapist and um, it will be downloadable from um, the App Store and Google Play by the end of this month. So we're doing a launch this month to get it out there, get talking about it and hopefully get that wider reach because I do a free um, a fi free five day challenge, I call it, where I teach people just um, five elements of the programme. And I've helped 6,000 people from 34 different countries. Like it's wow. just, it's international. It's It doesn't matter if they don't speak English with their child, as long as they've got enough English to access it. And I know that there's so many parents out there that need this. And I just, it's 
the shouting about it, the reaching it, the getting yeah. that word out there that's difficult once they find me. I like to feel like they feel like they've found what they've been looking for. And so the app is part of that kind of getting it out and also taking it away from Facebook a little bit. That sounds wonderful, Jo. Um it's a lot of work, isn't it? You've got an app and you've got, you know, you talked about these six thousand people. Um, have you found that other people have been supportive and how have they been instrumental in your journey of of can so i'm very lucky to have a lovely family i've got four children my eldest i cannot quite believe is going to be 21 on monday Uh, my youngest is nine and um i've got a very supportive husband and they have i mean it's starting more and more to feel like a family business because Um, they're getting involved more my daughter's brilliant at kind of graphics and workbooks and you know she'll put all of those things together and um, my son's really techy and so he'll kind of get involved and my husband is uh well he's my biggest cheerleader my biggest emotional support and also um helps with all the childcare and the house stuff so it's a real kind of pulling together of all of us and um we're lucky enough that he was in the police and he took very early retirement so in the last 18 months he's been he's been at home and and helping in the business and in the house so I've been very fortunate to have that support and honestly I don't think that I would have been able to keep going without that it's definitely not something that you can do on your own um I'm also growing a team of practitioners so these are parents who've been through the program and they want to then be able to support other parents in their local area um they're kind of I think the words we call them can do practitioners but can doulas is Mm -hmm. probably the right word for them when you talk about that bringing them together because they walk alongside the parents they help them through the program they're there as a listening ear as someone who's been there and experienced what the what all of those emotions and has now kind of gone through the the can-do approach and, and is feeling much more confident about helping their child so um so I've got them and I've got a, a couple of people that help um a community manager and a play a play specialist who've been there they're both parents that went through it they've been there since the beginning and kind of keep me going so definitely it's it's a growing team and a very very supportive team and I think the beauty of it is because of what it is it attracts those people who get it and want to feel like that and want to the world to be like that and so you find that you're surrounded by people that that kind of sing from that hymn sheet and really want to make the world a better place which is is very lucky for me because I have them all supporting me. Yeah, well, you're talking earlier on about standing in the in the goal, but I did very much get the visual of, you know, like like a, a a sports team, and then you've got all these spectators who just completely believe in in this team and what they're doing, and uh, it's a, a wonderful positive space. Um, just speaking to you now is such a a, a positive space, so I uh, can't imagine how these parents feel having done um a program with you um we're nearly at the end of of the episode Uh, a couple of things um firstly what would you say to somebody um who says no really really they they really can't (laughs) do this i say that we're not getting it right for them if the child can't do something, it's that the adults around them, or it probably works amongst adults, we're not getting it right for that. We've either not got the goal right, or we've not got the support right, or we've not got the environment right, or we've just not got our expectations right. And actually looking at the child can't is never a reflection of the child it's always a reflection of everything else and that's not to blame the parents it's not that they're doing something wrong it's just that things need tweaking we do a lot of tweaking in can do we've just got to tweak things so that the child gets that support and when you get it right they start to make that progress it might not be the progress that you initially set on a set into it with so often it'll be well they can't talk the speech therapist has told me they'll never talk mm-hmm. and you're like well let's just leave talking there for now let's look at what they can do and what that next step is when we start doing that it is incredible how these children move forward and so if they can't we just need to change it we need to change it for them 
Lovely. Um, we always uh, have a challenge that we we kind of throw out to the listeners. Um, so I think it seems like an obvious challenge would be um, what is what is one thing that you you really feel like you can't do? And if you were to sit down and look at the the parameters and the the challenges, what might you be able to to tweak um, in order to move forward? And if you really can't move forward, what can you do? Um, thinking about the gifts and skills and things like that, maybe just write a list of what you can do um, and and start there. Joe, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And I think it's about putting that goal there. So um, maybe it's that you can't fly, like you want to go on holiday, but you can't fly. And then finding the things that you can do that are part of that. Like you might be able to go to the airport or you might be able to um, go somewhere in the car that's equally good. Like find out what you can do so that that can't gets nearer and, and, and that feels more attainable. A uh, step towards it with tiny cans and see whether you can reach your car. Love it. I have to say, I was quite surprised when you said I can't fly because I was thinking, well, I, I can't fly. <laughs> but I was like, oh, in a plane. <laughs> I was Sorry. like, oh, Joe, I really can't fly. I really I'm can't. Asking. Well, you could if maybe you went and got some. <laughs> I have the silly thing with my husband. I say you you can if you believe you can, but probably not probably not, not that flying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a few more generations, maybe. <laughs> um, it's been so inspiring, and as I said, just such a positive space. Um, people listening, do you get? in touch with Joe, as she says at the moment um she is on facebook we'll put all her details in the show notes but she's moving over to this incredible app um so do get in touch with her connect with her um and soak up some of that amazing positivity um so that you can start looking at, at what you can do uh joe we now come to the part of the episode where i um create a poem um, and I'm feeling incredibly inspired. And yet there's a little voice in the back of my mind that's saying, and you still can't really, <laughs> you can't really do this. <laughs> so <laughs> I will just take a few seconds. I can't fly, but I can try. I can look at those things around me and I can question why. And I can go to people who see the things I can. And I can do so many things. And I am more than. And what right do I have to tell others that they can't and they shouldn't and they couldn't and they won't and they shan't? Because we are human beings and we are all of value. So don't look at what you can't do. Look at what you can do. That was all right, wasn't it? I love that. That was amazing. Oh, well see, done. inspired Incredible. by my guest, as always. <laughs> um, I am absolutely sure people will be getting in touch with you. I know that you're a lot of what people need right now. So thank you for being that. Thank you for believing in yourself and just getting on with it, quite frankly, um, and being this sunshine that people need right now and uh i'm getting a bit emotional so i think i better just say thank you joe and oh, thank goodbye you so much for having me thank you goodbye Bye.